Okay, um, so this is a talk about Perky as uh, your personal storage system for life. Um, I'm Brad Fitzpatrick. I'm Mathieu. And so, um, who saw our talk two years ago by chance? About a quarter of the people. Um, we have so to explain to some people this is, this is county store. Get in there. I'm getting there. <laughs> so two years ago, we uh, gave a talk uh, about Camly Store. We've since renamed the project to Perkeep. We have this little derpy bird uh, parakeet as our logo. Um, it's the same project. It just ha does more stuff now, and it has a cuter mascot. Um, and so we're going to divide that talk into these mainly four parts. So we're going to give you a long overview of what Perkeep is. Then we're going to explain why why it exists, why we created it. And then we're going to drill down into the details of how it actually works. And finally, we're going to talk a bit more about the project, the community, these kind of things. And finally, Live Live yeah. Yeah. if they work, if the monitor works. Um, OK, so uh, first of all, what is Perkeep? Um, Perkeep is a whole set of components that all work together really nicely. But that is very scary by itself. So we'll kind of start with like the web UI, the things that users might actually see. Um, so, so, yeah, we're going to describe you uh, first what, what you see uh, the most commonly as a user. So we have a web UI with, you know, with, you know this top uh, menu that allows you to navigate to different parts of the UI. And you have a search URL uh, on top. Then, of course, you have all the objects that are in your store that are displayed. And when you select some of these objects, you get this menu on the right, which is a contextual menu for different kind of actions. You can see that you can select them all, unselect, create a new like container for your objects. You can also share or download your objects, like you would do one of them with, is downloaded. And if you select a lot of them, you get a zip with all of them. So this search query is showing uh, file name startup text, just to show that, yes, we support files, but we kind of consider files boring and uh, increasingly antiquated. Um, nowadays, people don't create as many files as they used to. They create a lot of their content online, where there isn't necessarily like a POSIX file on their local machine. Um, so of course, we also support photos um, and showing you kind of an infinite stream of your photos. Um, but these aren't really more, much more interesting than uh, files, because they are kind of like you know JPEGs or files that you know. Here, for instance, is a search for just my panoramic photos. In the search bar, there it says, is pano. Um, but more interestingly, we support things like importing, uh, storing, indexing, and searching your tweets and rendering your tweets. So even if Twitter goes away, we still have a copy of them all. Um, and yeah, some of them have contained media, so we slurp those in too. But like this tweet, for instance, isn't like a file on my POSIX file system that I can back up with some backup software. Um, likewise, we support indexing and searching and importing things like check-ins from sites like Foursquare Swarm. Um, and by default, if you go to your UI, this is my personal instance, you see like an infinite uh, scrolling list of all your content, whether that's photos or tweets or check-ins or whatever. Um, files too, if you haven't uh, used files. And so for all of this stuff, um, you can see that we also have an interface uh, that is a map one. So all of these, like the four, well, it was four square, it's now Swarm, as the, uh, displayed the tweets, the images, anything that has a location, really, latitude and longitude, it's kind of easy to deal with. No, and we can display them all. And you see, you can have another kind of search query at the top, which shows a, um, a few check-ins in a specific location. Or at, is it a specific? Yeah. No, this, these, these are all so, my check-ins in 2018. And yeah. Yeah, this is a zooming in to the Seattle area. If you zoom in, you get more detail. And so here's my check-ins around Seattle in 2018. And if I click on one of these markers, um, there is a photo I took on a ferry in the water. And you click that again, and you can see uh, my wife and kid. These are also new features in the last two years. My wife and kid? Both of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> new development. Uh, less hacking time. Uh, here is a uh, search query for location Moscow. And this searches both your photos and tweets and check-ins uh, in Moscow. And of course, as we are like an open source uh, computer project, we have a common line interface, you know, so it allows you to do all sorts of crazy stuff from the low level one, which allows you to access the blob storage to the very high level stuff that allows you to do searches. And then you can, you know, um, combine all kinds of commands to automate all your workflow if you need to. Um, also, there's a fuse interface, so if you want to 
if you're like old school and you want your file system, you can mount your whole world and access it as if it's a local machine. And there's all these magic directories. There's like a, a magic directory called recent that does a search query of like things you've interacted with recently. So you can like upload a photo from your phone and then find it in your recent folder. Um, there's also versioning support. So uh, if I you know, echo hello Linux of Northwest into this um, mutable directory foo, um, I can cat it back and see it. But if I look back in the at directory, I can put in an arbitrary date string and it supports like dozens of formats. You can see how this file looked two years ago, and then it just said hello Linux Fest. So you never lose anything. There's, um, yeah. And yeah, we also have a mobile client. It's only Android for now. Um, but yeah, you, it's better than nothing. So you can upload your files, mainly your photos. You can do that manually, or you, you know, we have the usual directories where photos are stored that are continuously watched and can upload them automatically for you whenever they, they arrive on your phone. Um, and we also have importers, like I kind of showed earlier, with like things like tweets and things from third-party uh, web providers. Um, this kind of runs as little agents that are within your uh, Prokeep server process, or it could be a separate process elsewhere. And it uh, so it uh, speaks the various APIs and converts it into uh, Prokeep's format and writes the blobs. Um, we currently have various importers. Um, we have to-dos for a bunch more. I mean, there's probably millions that we don't have, but. This is kind of the best place to contribute to the project, to write new importers, and most of these have come from uh, third-party contributors. Um, the UI is super sexy. Let's see, like, configure your app and, like, add your accounts and stuff. But you never go in here. Like, you go in here, like, once, so we don't really spend any don't time. Don't forget my it. stuff, please. Um, there's no secret there. No, there's no secret. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, finally, we also have a bunch of uh, third-party apps that anyone can build on top of Perky because we have this API. So you can use Perkip as your like storage area. You can use it to search capabilities. And for example, we have this one, which is we call the publisher of publish, which, as it says, allows you to directly publish some of your objects directly to the whole world. And these are like a bunch of high kick photos from a trip I took yeah. on oh. my publisher instance. Yeah, so this is like a you know, world accessible without authentication if you just want to put your photos online. But like the database behind it is your Perkip instance that's all private. So uh, we showed you the, the high-level stuff, and that was the, yeah, the main overview of everything you could use, but now... So why did we build all this crap? Um, and the, the real question is, do you care about your data? And are you still going to care about your data in five years or 20, 60 years? Like, I, I kind of want to have all my stuff when I'm 100, and I want you know, my descendants to have my photos and stuff, because you know, we pass down photo galleries, you know, like. My parents still have all their books of photos and all their negatives and stuff that they've been digitizing. Um, so I'm increasingly concerned that like, in the current world, people put all their crap um, elsewhere on the web and those sites shut down. I also want to have unified search amongst all these silos. I want to do search queries like, show me all tweets that occurred you know, two hours after I had been checked into a bar or something like that. These are search queries that no one silo can provide you because you know, Twitter has your tweets, but Foursquare or Swarm has your check-ins, and so you can't join these data sources and do fun queries, like, you know, show me all my, you know, photos at sporting arenas or whatever like that. Um, so, yeah, let's not forget that sites die for any number of reasons, and when they die, they usually die with your data. So, yeah, they, here's a bunch of reasons why they could die. You know, they run out of money, or they get destroyed by a competitor, or they become evil, or bought by someone evil who, you know, use your data as it shouldn't, and you don't, you can't access it or it dies. Uh, I mean, as one maybe example, I created LiveJournal many years ago in like 1999, and it has changed hands several times now, and you know, I can't personally vouch for any future owners because they keep, you know, reselling the company. And with that, they keep reselling the data. Um, it has an API, and you get your data out of LiveJournal, and hopefully any user who used it did, because who knows what's going to happen in the future. So what can you do about it? Well, our advice is that you should own your data so that you can you know, stay in control of it. And this is where Perkip comes in. You know, that, that is our goal. It is a project that helps you keep your content and your online memories forever. So two years ago, I told a story here about this uh, crappy table I had just made. Um, we had moved into a new house and did it uh, right before Thanksgiving. And so everyone was coming over to play games, I guess in this case, Boggle. Um, but we didn't have a table, and um, so we went to the store, and we bought some lumber, and we bought a saw, and we 
we used these tools and we created a table and everyone was happy. And at this point, I didn't care if the original stores went out of business because I had my table. And this is kind of how things used to work. You know, you would like buy a computer, it's a tool, or WordPerfect or open source software was a tool, and you had your data on your little disk. Nowadays, you give your content to these guys and they have the disks. And that is very sad because you don't have the disk and you may not have it in 60, 80 years. So like we said, sites die. Um, this is an ongoing list of all the sites that have died over time and it just keeps growing. Um, so this is why we have the per keep uh, importers. The idea is that you publish to them and then you suck it back into your instance. Um, this is one model. Uh, this model is commonly called pesos, um, publish elsewhere or syndicate to your own site. There's various other models where you, you know, publish first to yours, then you syndicate out. Um, but it's better than uh, not having your data. Um, but yeah, then it doesn't matter who goes out of business because you still all have it. Um, so yeah, that was um, what it is and why we did it and why it exists. And now we're going to show you, as promised, how it all works. Yeah, yeah so we showed you the top layers um, and now we're going to kind of start from the bottom and work our way up from the blob storage. Um, so yeah, uh, blob storage, what it is. It's, big, it's simply that we store the data as blobs, which are like a chunk of data, which is a maximum six, 16 megabytes. And there is absolutely no file name involved, no metadata, no MIME type, no versions. It's just an immutable blob. And at this point, a lot of people scoff and they say, well, surely you must need file names and metadata. Cause how do you represent anything? Um, all that is handled at upper levels. At the bottom layer, you just have some bytes and they're content addressable. And uh, we call these blob refs. The blob ref starts with the, uh, the hash function identifier. We used to use SHA-1, but SHA-1 is showing signs of being busted. So now uh, the default is not SHA-1, but we still support your old data in there. We just don't let you write new ones. And, um, but yeah, so this is how you get back one of these blobs. And everything is kind of built up of blob refs and blobs. Uh, content addressable has a lot of advantages that it's, it's super simple that you get content du duplication for free. It's super cacheable because there's no versions. You don't need expiration times. Um, you can set your cache headers to like, you know, infinity. And you get integrity checking for free if there's any like disk corruption, you know. Um, <coughs> as an example of using uh, the command line interface, um, you could say pk list on a new instance and you see that there are no blobs. And then you can um, uh, echo hello into pk put blob and you get back a blob ref. Uh, it's a little truncated here for uh, legibility. And if you, put, if you do the same command again, you get the exact same blob ref because hello, the bytes of hello are still the bytes of hello. So there's the content deduplication. You do echo world, you get a different blob ref and pk list, and you see your blob refs and the size. Maybe you call it metadata, but whatever. Um, so yeah, we stored blob refs and size, and you get them back in, uh, in lexical order. And then you can get a blob with pk git. Um, on my personal instance, I currently have about 6.6 .6 million blobs. Um, Obviously, I didn't use PK put to put them all there. Um, the uh, blob server operations that, uh, that the, like, the low-level interface can do is just you put a blob, you get a blob by hash, or you can enumerate all the blobs in sorted order. Um, notably, there's no delete. It's much harder to lose your data if uh, we don't let you delete it. Um, then the only way to delete it or to lose it is if you know, there's hardware failures and stuff like that, but you know, we, we also deal with that. There is kind of a way to delete it in emergencies if you really, really need to, but we make it very hard and you have to like restart in special modes and stuff like that. Um, in Go, in our main server implementation, um, I mean, uh, per keep is defined as a you know, specification of uh, APIs and, and file formats and stuff, but we have our kind of de facto popular implementation that's in Go. And internally, we have a, a Go interface that supports kind of these four operations. and. Because it's a very easy interface to implement, there are tons of implementations of the blob storage. So these, um, these green ones are kind of like actually storing your bytes. You can either store it in local files, or you can store it in like kind of a packed way where there's good data locality and like chunks of your data that are accessed together are stored contiguously on disk. Um, there's, you can also store your bytes on Mongo. These ones in the white are like kind of cloud storage providers. Um, all these ones in uh, kind of orangey brown are ones that let you compose your blob storage in different ways. Um, or you can talk to a remote per keep instance, so you can run multiple instances and have them like sync. And so these orange ones let you do like weird things like control the, the flow of like the read path of blobs, the write path of blobs, the replication policies, the synchronous and asynchronous replication of how your stuff goes. And you might see all that and be like, oh my god, this is really complicated, I'm going to screw it up. 
Um, but you can't screw anything up in Prokeep. One of the design goals is uh, you, can't, you can't really make a mistake. There's no versions, there's no deleting, it's all immutable. So it's always safe to like take this Prokeep server of yours and this Prokeep server of yours and just like copy all the files any which way. Um, since there are no versions, you're not gonna overwrite something. Like whenever I have two machines and I'm using rsync, I'm like, well, I think that's the same home directory. Am I gonna rsync from this machine to this machine? Am I gonna nuke it? Which, or did I edit the file there last? And so I'm always terrified of using rsync and like screwing something up. But with Prokeep, you can't screw anything up because all the blobs are immutable and you can always add things, you can't replace things, so yeah. Um, and if you are paranoid that something is out of sync, there's a the little like sync validation thing so you can verify that all your copies have what you want and you can do this from the command line tool or there's a thing in the web UI where you can configure as many sync pairs as you want, uh, one-way sync pairs, or you can set up two one-way sync pairs to make a pair so you can write to either one and they get eventually consistent. Um, here I'm like validating that all my blobs are on S3 as I thought, and so far it's found like you know nothing that's screwed up and it's 11.3% through. It takes a couple minutes. Um, all right, so we have blob here and blob there, but what is actually a blob? What it is? You put anything you want in a blob. Um, you could put some middle chunk of a JPEG in a blob, which is probably what most of my 6.6 .6 million blobs are, some like random region of a, uh, of a JPEG. However, some blobs uh, are kind of special to us and to Perkeep. And this is what we call the Perkeep schema. It's a bunch of blobs which seem to be formatted in a certain way. And indeed they are, because they're actually JSON objects. So each blob is a JSON object with a bunch of different fields that are well defined to us in, by convention. And you're going to ask, Wait, why JSON? Why not any binary format that would be more efficient, that you could you know, transfer uh, faster or whatever? And the reason there is we care a lot about data archaeology and people understanding what all this crap is in you know, 60, 80 years. And by picking JSON, we're picking something. We, we, we assume that archaeologists in 80 years will understand what the web is, because the web is pretty popular, <laughs> and ASCII and UTF-8 are very well known. Um, so if we, if we invent our own binary serialization format or we pick one of like the Avro or Thrift or Protobuf and we pick the wrong one that doesn't win in 80 years, then we have this weirdo historical format that archaeologists can't understand. But if we pick something that like is in already in popular use like uh, JSON with UTF-8 and we're very verbose in the fields, then it's readable. Um, we also make sure we're very verbose in our blob identifiers. Earlier I showed that we can have SHA-1 or SHA-2 in our refs. We explicitly put the hash function name in there, so archaeologists in the future will know what all that hex crap is afterwards. Uh, it also lets us upgrade over time, like when we upgraded from SHA-1 to uh, SHA-256 or SHA-224, that um, we can do that gracefully without having to re-index the world like Git is struggling with right now. Um, so we talked about how we support files. Uh, even though files are boring, we support modeling files. For instance, if I um, echo hello world to hello.txt and I pk put hello.txt, I get some blob ref back. Um, but that blob ref is not the bytes hello world. If I get that back, I get back some JSON blob here. That is, this is a uh, per keep schema blob. And you can see the parts are there. There's this one part of data that's 15 bytes. And if we get that identifier down here, you can see the actual bytes hello world. But it shows you know the original file name. It shows you the permissions and the owner. So we support, you know, um, we also support like gigantic files. Even though we only store 60 meg blobs, you can put like a five terabyte uh, video file or VM image, and it's you know a big Merkle tree of chunks with uh, all your data at the leaves. And we do the whole rolling checksum thing, where we don't just cut the file at every 16 meg exactly. Instead, we we compute this rolling checksum over the file, and when the checksum has a certain number of you know bits and that uh, that U in 32, that decides the strength of the cut point. And then we kind of balance that into a Merkle tree. So even if your file kind of shifts around a little bit or you know, gets things in the middle, we still do uh, deduplication without re-uploading the whole thing. Like if you had a, a 16 meg MP3 file with the ID3 header in the front, and you modified the ID3 header to like change the name of the song title by one byte, your whole 16 meg MP3 file shifted by one byte, you're not re-duplicating the whole 16 meg because the cut points are on the contents, not on the, uh, the length boundaries. So we can very efficiently store gigantic files and like VM images. This also lets us uh, do efficient seeks to any point in the file and do like arbitrary reads, like pread system calls and stuff for fuse. 
Um, we support directories. Um, a directory, like here, we make a directory foo, and we put files A and bar into it, and we get the, uh, the blob ref for the directory back out. We see that's, you know, can we have directory, and we don't see the entries there. There's another reference to an entries thing, and that entries is a static set of members, and those two members themselves are uh, schema blobs that represent the, the file foo and bar. So you can, um, you could like PK put your home directory and we'll just only put things that have changed and then it'll recompute kind of like the, uh, the Merkle tree-ish top directory and re, and re add that. So then this also lets you go back and look at uh, your home directory at any point in time if you just, you know, back it up like once an hour or whatever. Um, so some blobs are, some schema blobs are super special and we sign those just like you kind of like sign git tags or whatever. Uh, we use OpenPGP, every user has a key pair. Um, we kind of deal with this behind the scenes if you're not like a, a crypto nerd. Um, by default, you just start the server and if you don't have one, it will create one for you. Um, so I had mentioned that I have 6.6 .6 million blobs. Um, the question here is how do I know which one of these are like tweets and which one of these are like the middle of some JPEG that's super boring? And that is where uh, we come to the indexing layer, which is like, yeah, the second most important thing in ProKeep because it allows you, you know, to organize your stuff. And basically what it is, is it's like another blob storage. It almost is the same interface, so it can receive blob, you can replicate blob too, and you can sync it with another blob storage. So it takes a blob, which is a bunch of information, and it transforms it in a you know, sorted uh, rows in a sorted key value store. So it's like more organized information already. And what is a sorted key value interface? So as, uh, as we saw before, uh, for the blob storage, we have this interface that we mainly implement in Go, but that is irrelevant. And those are basically the three operations that you need to implement to have a sorted key value that you can use as an index. So the usual set, you know, if you want to set a value, uh, under a key, then if you want to retrie retrieve that value uh, from a key, and then you have this file operation that gives you an iterator so you can enumerate through all your uh, organized rows. And those are like the implementations we already have, but it's very easy to add new ones. And by default, we use level DB because you know you have no dependency with that and it works pretty well. But yeah, you know we have the, the SQL one, SQLite, MySQL, etc. Um, so, also, it's not really important where your index is or how it is implemented or where, because it can be deleted, it can be corrupted, it doesn't matter. It's easy to rebuild it from just from your blobs, because it's just, you know, you go through all your blobs and you write all these rows that just makes everything faster or unorganized. Yeah, notably, you don't have to, like, index your blobs in order. If you, you've got blobs A, B, C the first time you index it, later you index C, A, B, you, you'll get to the same index in the end. So we're going to see really what happens, you know, when Perkip receives a blob, what happens, how, what, how, what does the index does with it. And so the, the first step is that we have this HTTP handler in front of everything and it receives the blob and the first thing it does, it, it, writes, it, it writes it to your, we'll, we'll call it the primary blob storage by the, you know, the default configuration. And then this blob gets synced or replicated or whatever you want to call it to the index layer, the index blob storage. Then, if it is like a, just a bunch of data from a file or whatever, if it's not a JSON schema, a Perkip schema, there's nothing to do because for now, it's not interesting. Otherwise, if it's a JSON schema, one of the Perkip schema, uh, the indexer, uh, you know, goes through it, analyzes it, and we're gonna write some rows. The first thing, it can, be, it's, it can be a file schema, as Brad showed you before. If it's a file schema, then you want to look at the data again from the file. So you get it from your blob storage, and you record any interesting stuff yeah, that you would want to recall about it, like it's not time, if it has some exif tags, it's location, um, you know, the dimensions of the image, etc., or some audio properties. Then, if it's a directory schema, as we showed before, you drill down into the schema and you get all the children and you record all the children. So you can later easily go back from the parent to the children fast. And finally, if it's a mutation schema on an object, which we'll, we will see what are objects and mutations uh, later in detail. But you know, if it's something that modifies an object, you first verify that it's a valid mutation, if it has a, you know, a valid uh, GPG signature, 
and you record all the attributes that are you know, modified by this mutation. It can be a target title or a location, anything that we record for the index. Finally, one last piece of the index, which is kind of an implementation detail, but we totally rely on it. It's this corpus, which is an optimized in-memory version of the index that as soon as the index rows has written, are written, the corpus gets the blob and also uh, does something with it. And so you could imagine it's an even more organized you know, structure. We have, we have these rows and we also have this structure in memory, that, which is a bunch of maps and lists which are lazily uh, reorganized. And so what, when the corpus gets the blob after the index rows have been written, you know, it, it updates all these maps and those lists, which are typically um, all the GPG signers, so the owners of the data, all the objects that we have, all the mutations on, the, on these objects, all the files and their attributes, image attributes, all this kind of stuff that we're interested in. They're now very, very well organized for fast access layer. And so, this is where we come to the search layer. Yeah, so that corpus basically exists um, as an optimization for the, uh, the search layer. So Perkeep has its own built-in uh, search interface. Um, there's basically two ways to search, which I uh, kind of call the easy way and the hard way. Um, easy way is kind of like you would search in Gmail with these kind of like, you know, is colon image operators that you saw uh, on the screenshots earlier. And so you could type these, and this is what, how we primarily search, and this compiles into the hard way for you. Um, so you can hear the images in a certain time range, you know, that's in Hawaii. Um, we have a bunch of different operators. There's um, documentation on the website and from the from the UI to say like what these all work. Uh, we also support things like and or not groups. Um, just the other day, I was adding support for iOS hike files, which are replacing JPEGs, and I found that I um, like 70 of my images um, weren't parsed properly and they didn't have thumbnails, and I, I had a bug in uh, my parser. Uh, so I did the search query to find my corrupt hike images. So I, I said all file names that are start at hike minus the set of hike files that have a width between one and like you know some arbitrary number. So basically, show me hike files that don't have a width, and uh, that basically means the hike files that I screwed up on. And so we fixed the bug, re-indexed these, um, and it was good. But it's, it's really nice to be able to do like you know sets and negations and you know um, the hard way if you want to do something custom is we have this JSON schema where you can do this whole kind of structured uh, nested search query. Um, the top level is a search query where you can either do an expression, which is kind of the easy way, or you can do a constraint. And a constraint is basically a, um, a matching policy that goes over your blobs. And uh, you're supposed to limit and sort. Uh, the constraint lets you look at properties of either the file or directory or claims or like properties of the permano for objects. Um, or like logical constraints that least do ands or ors or xors, um, and then do nested uh, constraints. Um, you know, subqueries and subqueries and joins. Uh, for each one, when you get down to like the leaf of things, like strings and integers, you can match integers on ranges, or you know, prefixes or suffixes, or you know, byte lengths of strings. So basically, any policy that you can think of about like matching or joining your data, you can express with uh, some JSON. So, for instance, if you do like a, a search for file name hello, star, hello, star, so any file name that contains hello, that compiles down to something like this, like a uh, constraint, uh, it's, a, it's a permanent, so it means it's an object we'll talk about, and the content points to a file where the file name contains hello. Um, and these can be like you know, a page long if you have something complicated, but then you can take these search queries and you can save them as saved searches, and then you can like use them later in, a, in the easy query language to, um, to reference a set of a complicated one. So, but generally, if, if you find yourself writing these like low-level ones too often, probably there's a missing operator in the easy search mode, and then you just you modify the search system. Oh, and here's yeah, here's the results of uh, PK search returning the blobs. So I we kept mentioning objects and permanodes, and this is addressing the question that Perkeep only stores immutable blobs. So the question is, how do you like model something that's mutable in an immutable world? Like, and also things like, how do we store a tweet or something that's like not a file? Um, so we have this concept called a permanode, and every time you run like PK put permanode or use the API or the web UI or an importer, it creates you a random, a random blob ref. So every time you run it, as opposed to before when we like echoed hello and we got the same blob ref back, every time you run PK put permanode, 
it, gets, it gives you a new blob ref. And if you look at one of these blob refs, um, I guess this should have been in red, you get back this thing. And what it is, it's a signed schema blob. Basically, there's a random, random string in here. This is just like some random, so many bytes, uh, basically farm coded. But then it's signed. So notably, there's a signer here, and this is this is me as a user. That represents my uh, my public key, and then this is a signature of the previous part of the blog. So all this does is establishes that there is an object in the world. The object has this identifier, and I am the owner of this object. So I can assert um, I'm the only one that can make mutations on it until I give other people access to make mutations on this. Um, if you get that thing here, that's just a public key block, so it's verifiable to other people in the world. Um, so you can do things like create an object, um, PK put permanent, and then you can put attributes on it like title, fancy title, and then we can put we can replace that title and say, oh, it's a better title. And then if you describe it, this is asking the search and indexing layers what it thinks of all this crap, and it says, oh, this thing, this is a permanent, and these are the current attributes, fancy title. Um, but you can also look at the history of this object, and you can say, what are all claims, which are basically um, anything that's signed, but show me all the mutations that have happened for this object over time. And you can say, well, first it had, you know, fancy title, then it had better title. Is this slide wrong? Yeah. Um, oh, it has it um, It's not. Yeah, this slide is wrong. Um, but here you can look at a point in time, say, so Describe this object as if it were, you know, then. Mm -hmm. So you can, this is how you look in the past. And basically you just ignore all mutations that happened past that time. Um, and now if I like look at my, uh, my list of blobs, there's all this other crap. And like a lot of these are like an object or <laughs> mutations on an object. And you know, they're quite small. They're stored efficiently. So uh, here's like doing a search query. I put a permanode. I do a search for all my funny things. All, all things that have tagged funny, I get nothing. But then I modify that first object, and I give it the tag funny, and I do the search again, and there it is. I got, I got my, my funny tweet or whatever. Um, That's the same way you would do it with the complicated search. Yeah, this is another example of like, you know, case insensitive search for tag funny. So um, we we can now we have works all our way back up from the search from the blob storage to the search and we're going to go back to what you would use as a user now that you understand how it works and this is actually the web UI. Yeah, I'm showing that the web UI also can do the nerdy stuff if you want to like drill down into like the low level guts from the web UI. So you can see all the the permanent attributes that we were talking about earlier. You can see them directly from the web UI if you go to the we have those aspects on the top of the web UI that are like all the interesting views. You can have an, an object. So you, as you, we showed the map earlier, so you could show this permanent on the map, and you can see all the, the you know the details of the permanent itself. But you can also even go further and look at the blob itself, what it contains, and you have all the contents of the blob and what the indexer has you know uh, indexed about that blob, everything it has found interesting about it, and what it holds. And same thing, what uh, all of the mutations that have happened on that permanent and that the indexer knows about, you can see all of them in the web UI. Uh, yeah, and uh, now we want to talk about kind of the project. Um, the project is about eight years old, and it started just about the time that Go became open source, which was um, November of 2009. I was, um, I was commuting at the time between San Francisco and Mountain View and Google, and is a very painful long bus ride. There was Wi-Fi, but the Wi-Fi is terrible. And um, I needed something to hack on. And at the time, I was working on Android. And the Android build system is terrible and um, really, really slow and requires like this monster $7,000 machine to compile. So I didn't have that on the shuttle. And I didn't really want to write Java. And um, I had this idea for like a storage system for, for Prakeep. And um, so I wanted to play with it. But I couldn't imagine writing in like any other language. I, I used to write a lot of Perl and Python, but I, I was kind of done with scripting languages with like compile errors, you know, like errors at runtime. And I didn't want to write in C++ because all the build system tooling is terrible. And I didn't want to write in Java because I had enough Java with Android. So Go just became open source and I didn't really know much about it. So I just decided to start hacking on it for fun because it worked well on a laptop and I could do it while sitting on a bus. And I kind of fell in love with it. Um, so I kept working on this, I kept working on this. 
And I kept sending patches to the Go team uh, to add stuff to the standard library and fix bugs to the standard library and flush out the HTTP implementation. So I actually now, um, much of the Go standard library came from Perkeep originally. Um, database stuff, HTTP stuff, a lot of like the JSON stuff, um, and uh, sub-process handling. So like I've, I, I work on the Go team now and I kind of like manage the uh, open source side of Go. But anyway, it's kind of gone hand in hand with a uh, Go development. It's probably one of the oldest uh, projects. So yeah, I uh, I work full time, uh, I guess on on Go, but this is kind of my uh, side project. And uh, and yeah, I kind of work full time on Perkeep now um, to you know make sure it is at least maintained and it uh, goes forward when uh, Brad doesn't have enough time to dedicate to it. <laughs> So yeah, he's generally responding to all the bug reports and when I'm filing bugs and copying him. Um, so we're now using Open Collective for funding. This is um, kind of a site like, um, where are all those other funding sites? Um, Patreon. Patreon? Yeah, yeah so Patreon is more kind of like... For artists. Yeah, it's not as geared towards open source or it doesn't work as well with open source, but Open Collective works much better with open source and lets like organizations fund organizations. So if like your user doesn't know that you're using libfoo.xy, but they really like your project and they want to fund your project, but your project is really dependent on libfoo xy, you're, a project can become a sponsor of another project. The cool thing is with Open Collective is all your funding, um, all, your, all your funding is public. So all your bills are public. So everyone sees that your, your balance sheet and where your money is going, and there's people who can like vote on bills or whatever or say that things can be approved. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Ramen money for all your upstream dependencies. <laughs> yeah, so our plan is to, uh, to do something for the people who are giving us money. We've just you know, been using this for a short period of time. Open Collective isn't too new, but they have an API. Um, so we wanted to, like, I don't know, maybe give them a thumbs up or something in the UI if, if they've paid or like, recognize them more on the website. But in the meantime, uh, thank you for the people who are paying for this. Um, anyone here paying for it? PDX up. Um, also, thank you for the developers. Um, there's about 120 people who have committed to the project overall, um, 23 that have done uh, kind of a number of commits. So uh, yay, open source. Um, here's um, some of our notable contributors who have done a lot of commits or major parts. Um, so if you want to get started and help with us, you can, of course, file bugs and extra. But we've done, we've kind of demonstrated that it's easy, you know, to build on top of Perkeep and also run it on the cloud or whatever. You don't need, you don't need a whole infrastructure. So we made this thing, which is a deployer on Google Cloud. And so if you go there, it will use your Google account to deploy a Perkeep instance on Google Cloud that you own. And of, of course, you pay for the CPU time, whatever the storage. A free tier. Free tier. Yeah, there's a free tier option. It, it, it kind of works. It kind of works. And um, we can do that. We have to give kudos to Let's Encrypt because thanks to them, we, can, we, we offer you some sort of DNS. And thanks to that DNS and Let's, Un Let's Encrypt, you get everything you know, uh, on HTTPS on that instance without any effort on your part. You can, of course, use your own DNS afterwards. And you should. But um, yeah, thanks to them. Uh, yeah, of course, you can, if you like doing things your own way, and eventually uh, you probably should if you want to, you know, hack or whatever, you can just use the usual Go tools to first get the server, which is perkeepd, so with this command, and all the tools to interact with the, the, the server. I guess this is for uh, following tip, but uh, we also do periodic releases, and you can just download binaries, and we run on, uh, we run on just about everything. Uh, including Windows, which we sometimes test. Thanks but for our, yeah, our developers who usually test for us if it works on Windows or not. A bunch of them are telling you, hey, you broke Windows, you want me to fix it? Okay. We just found out that there's a service to run Windows uh, CI systems, but we don't oh, yeah. have that set up. But this is a Linux conference, so whatever. No Windows. <laughs> and yeah, this is how, of course, then you can, how we can help us file bugs, try it, anything you find, you can file a bug, or, well, search if there is a bug already, of course. Um, yeah, our docs are not the best. We, we usually just use generated uh, Godoc, because Godoc is already very good, so we rely on that, but there's a lot of doc writing to be done. And then if you want to contribute code or whatever, 
uh, writing an importer is one of the best way because it's we've done it a lot of times. We have a, a good code base for it. So it's just mainly replicating what already works with other parts, understanding what their API is, hoping that it won't change in like two months, two months, and that your importer will break. And so that's one thing you can do easily. And then you can also write an app if there's anything you're interested in. If and if you want to store it on Perkeep, you can write like we did uh, the publisher, or, or we, we've done another one that relies on per keep you know, to store things and search things. As an aside, APIs do change all the time it's, yeah. and have bugs, and it's really terrible. Like even Google Photos, Google Photos doesn't have an API. They have, they support the old Picasa web API, which had a different data model, and you can only have 10,000 photos in a, in a gallery, but Google Photos doesn't have galleries. <laughs> so there's one kind of implicit default gallery. So once you have 10,000 photos in Google Photos, you can't get it out using the Picasa API, which is a whole bunch of like XML and crap. So then you have to use the Google Drive API, to, but first you have to go in Google Drive and say, make my Google Photos available in Google Drive, and then you can get it, but like the metadata is kind of different. So we have to like do all this matching up to find like which identifiers in the Picasa Web API are like the same identifiers from the Google Drive API and like not store like two photo uh, permanent nodes. So I work at Google and I file bugs, but you know, the machine moves slowly. So, uh, yeah, the, these are the resources you can use to get started or ask questions. Or we we now have a fairly stable presence on IRC if you want to. And um, yeah, our new mailing list, and of course we are hosted on GitHub as well. Oh, we do also do all the code review on um, Garrett. on Garrett because it's just much better for code review. Uh, GitHub is getting better, but we still find it a little painful. But um. All the code is mirrored to GitHub, and we use GitHub for issued trackers and stuff like that. Yeah. You did say questions, right? Uh, not yet, <laughs> but okay. sure. So how, how do you use this personally? Every there you day? go. Now you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of technology. I wonder how you use this personally. What do you do after you tweet? You know, what do you do when you have a new photo? How, how does the workflow look like? OK, uh, the question for the live recording is, uh, how, how do we actually personally use all this stuff? Like, what do we do once we get the, twi the tweet um, mirrored and stuff? So, personally, I do all my backups into this, like, so traditional files and stuff like that. So I have it, and I can go back if I, you know, lose things. Um, I use it for also off-site backups, so I, I mirror to, like, S3 and Google Cloud. So I have a, a local copy in, in my house, and, but I also have it all amongst the cloud. Um, and you are sync them, or, or how do you... No, it has built-in sync. The, the, the importer does it, does it yeah. for you. It gets all your tweets all the time. You can well, no, I think he was asking the blob replication. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can use rsync if you want. If you do like the file storage, blob storage, then you can use rsync, but it's kind of pointless. You can just um, you can just have it manage it for you, and then it'll validate things and stuff. Um, and it also, one of the blob storage is an encryption wrapper, so if you don't trust storing your blobs in the, crowd, in the cloud, you can encrypt it before you put it in the cloud, and it will deal with all the encryption and transparent decryption while it accesses it from the cloud and you could have like your local instance have you know a subset of your data and have the majority of your data in the cloud and like lazily fault it in as needed and decrypt it from the cloud and then cache it locally um, so like if your if your laptop doesn't have like the terabytes you need your laptop you can you know PK mount it uh, and use the fuse file system on your laptop and then just lazily fault in the data as you need it and it'll have a you know cache of your recent things um, I also use it for uh, searching a lot uh, Twitter's search only lets you search back like so many months and like doesn't let you search replies. So if like there's a tweet that I like was explaining something or linking to something, I, I use uh, per keep search to search my tweets because it's a much better, it's much more powerful search API than Twitter's. Um, I also search my old check-ins because uh, the Swarm app doesn't really have good search. So if I I'm, like was in a city a couple years ago and I went to a restaurant and I couldn't remember like what the restaurant or the bar I liked is, I can go find that restaurant or bar really quickly. Or I can zoom in on the map and like, oh yeah, that's the bar. Um, so yeah, I, just, I use it to explore my old data. And also like when I'm bored, I'll just look at the map view and I'll like zoom in and like look at photos from like some place on vacation. Like I was just uh, in New Zealand a few years ago and uh, there's all these beautiful photos and I kind of forgot about them and I was looking at the map view and I saw like, oh, we could do demos actually. Um, Where's my mouse? Yeah, it really is like a, a, book, a photo book that you never think of opening it, but the map view forces you to open it, and you're like, oh, I have all, all these great photos. That's cool. Um, I have a question. Yeah, questions away. So, um, uh, pesos and posse. 
um, mentioned it, um, and I, I, this I, we've had. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I, I um, it, that comes from any web folks. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of like pesos is, is uh, published elsewhere, syndicated on your own site, and that's kind of what um, Perkeep is is focused on mostly. Um, I think any web folks kind of see that as a transitional phase. Yeah. On the way to to Posse, where you where you're putting your data into your own site and just it just sharing it on Twitter rather than yeah. and, and so I, I'm what I'm and this is all this is this is the thing that I always struggle with with Perkeep is like I really want to go the Posse way. Yep. And I'm I'm, I'm let, let me summarize your question. Um, so earlier I said. Uh, Pesos, which is like you publish um, on some third party site like Twitter and you suck it back into Perkeep, but it, the model is really busted. You should own the data first and then give it to them. That's just like the posse model, right? Um, we want to get there. We actually want to go further and say that you are the only hard drive. Your hard drive is on the cloud and you use them as a tool and they owe off to you and you, they use your hard drive. And so we have one of our uh, storage plugins, it's called Namespace, and that lets you give a, a blob storage interface to somebody else. Mm -hmm and lets them use a subset of it and they, so they can read, write, and delete in their own sandbox, but you have access to the whole world. So they're basically in, like, in a container. And so that way, they can build an app on top of like reading and writing to your blob storage directly. And this is kind of like the model we would like to go, but good luck convincing like, Twitter to like, support Perkeep as a backend. So like, we're pragmatic in the meantime and say, you know, most of these sites are not, don't care about IndieWeb, so we'll just suck in stuff. But we want developers to build on top of like using Perkeep as the direct backend, using the, uh, the API and the app interface and stuff. I've been having a lot of success with just like publishing a blog and then, and then basically drop a link wherever I want to share it. Yeah, or um, photos. Yeah. You can go the posty way with photos already. Your own photos. You can directly store them on Perkeep and then share them wherever you want. Anyway, so here's a, here's like, you know, Zooming into New Zealand and seeing like uh, <laughs> zooming in too far. <laughs> this uh, leaflet library we use is uh, so now you can like, see check-ins and you can see um, here's a here's an image things in New Zealand. Oh yeah, that's a useful one. <laughs> is there an upper limit to your data size? Um, no, uh, I mean all all like the search and indexing stuff. Should should scale. We have nothing that's like we try to avoid anything that's like O of N. So, so should be fine. I mean, this leaflet thing kind of uh, sucks at high number of markers. So we recently restricted it to like 250 markers or something, which seems to make it perform a little bit better. And we have um we have a JavaScript bug right now. We kind of suck at front end stuff where sometimes we reset the map. You saw it like zoomed all the way out there. It was finishing another XHR or something, and it had a different location bounds, and it zoomed me back out to a sub-query that was happening. But, but yeah, you can see like tweets and, and check-ins and stuff here. The, the, the size limit is basically how we scale in algorithm and don't make things too slow when you have too much data. We just have to be good at like, that. But so, sometimes, like when we were playing with this the other day, we found that a search query was taking like three seconds. And we found that the query, there's a query optimizer in the search layer that looks at you know, like that big complicated JSON thing and decides like what indexes and which data structures in the corpus to use. And we found that it was not using a good one. So we fixed the query planner to like recognize a certain pattern and use the right index, and then it was like instant. So, uh, and then we added test and we make sure that like it uses that index in the future. And we try to optimize all the common queries that the UI and stuff does. And if, you, if it's using the wrong one, you can give it hints about which indexes to use. But worst case, you can get into cases where it's like linear scan and there doesn't exist an index in, in the corpus or an index. Um. Since this is committee built, do you have any schedule for the next release at all? Or next two days? We tried to do it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the plan is, uh, yeah, he le he's here for another week. Uh, and then we're, we're going to try to get a 0 0.10 release out in the next couple days. It was supposed to be like yesterday, but we decided to do slides instead. And, um, and then we want to do like a 1.0 within like a month or something. I don't we know if you've noticed, but we've already made a new Android release a few days ago. <laughs> So like here's you know like check-ins and here's like tweets and you know like here's uh, sad piggy here's like you know kind of all my stuff. Uh, We've been lazy about it because it's so easy to you know install with Go, so it's easy to install for so from source. But yeah, we should do binary releases often. There's my baby's butt sleeping. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Uh, so you talked a little bit about being really agnostic as far as storage goes, even cloud or local. Um, so what is like the experience from like my side of it? It's like, okay, say I want to do S3 and we'll like divide it up into two separate service providers yeah. just in case one, you know, either geo location based or stuff. Yeah. So the, the question is, what's the user experience for dealing with like multiple blob storage providers? Um, so there's, again, the easy way and the hard way. Um, are the config file for the server uh, supports this config file that the easy way we support the common configurations and if you want to use S3 you put in your S3 you know uh, key for your bucket or whatever or if you want to use Google Cloud you put in the access token and bucket thing in there and then we wire it up in what we assume you want you know like you want the, if you specify the local disk path and you like suppose home var blobs you know Brad we're like okay you probably want your blobs there and you probably want to replicate on S3 and we configure all the sync pairs and stuff. Um, so it synchronously likes writes to the first blob store, and then I think it, it asynchronously. Does yeah, it, it, by default, it synchronously writes to your. Um, it, it doesn't acknowledge the write to the client until it's both indexed it locally mm -hmm. and written it to the one blob store. But then it sets up an asynchronous replication pair uh, to your remote cloudy ones, and that that runs in the background and validates in the background and stuff. But if you want to do something. Um, crazy weird custom. or just custom, you can wire up whatever you want. You, so basically you list all your storage providers, you spit like which one's the default, and then some of them could be like a conditional one or a routing one, or you can like a, a, a synchronous replication one or an async replication one, and you can wire up the whole graph you want. So you can specify the, the path for reads, the path for writes. Okay, cool, and since it's all uh, PGP, you can do in like a friend, like say if I had a yeah. friend who had a server, I could say, hey, Store X yeah, of and that's one thing we want to support is like being able to like discover other people's instances by the public key, like do a big distributed hash table thing where you can find their instance and they can host your blobs and it'll be like, we support an encryption target already. So, and we support this like kind of subset thing. So your friends could, ha and we support a cache layer that has an upper bound. So you can say like, I will store, you know, like 20 gig of your encrypted blobs and you're just like cross replicating each other's stuff. And we didn't talk about search at all, but you can already like <coughs> share parts of your blobs and you give this one blob, which is like an authorization. So you give this one blob to your friend and they can use it to slurp everything that you've decided that you can share recursively down. So it's usually for directories, you know, if you have store directories, you say, hey, I want to share this whole directory. They get one blob, they use the command line tool or the web UI and they slurp this whole directory. Or, or you just uh, fuse mount it. So like mm -hmm. uh, last time he was here, I... I had all the photos uh, of mine from his trip, so I gave him a, a share URL, and it was just basically, a, that thing is a JSON schema blob that says it's a share kind of access token, and it says, it points to this other thing, which was a directory, and the, the top one says it's transitive, anything that's reachable from the directory, like all the data bytes he has access to. And then he presents that to my blob server, you know, authenticating as, as him, um, and then my server will get, serve those blobs if he presented the access token for it which was you know, that magic blob. And then he could, he could just PK mount that directly and just navigate into it and you know, click around and see his photos. And behind the scenes, it's faulting in all the blobs and caching it on his instance. So we want to make this a little bit more transparent and all like, happen within the web UI. So we want to kind of have like, a friends model and, you know, sort of thing or like a followers model. Eventually, I you know, kind of want to do the content first in here and like, do my posts, you know, like replace you know, Facebook and Twitter and do my social networking and my photo sharing all within the app and let, you know, and then people that I'm friends with can have different, you know, access and stuff, be in different groups. Uh, so uh, you're talking about service providers, Google and Amazon. Uh, it sounds like it's possible, but I was wondering, uh, do you guys have any um, development or discussions around uh, like consensus-based uh, storage, like uh, a file coin and shit? Uh, yeah, exactly. File coin uh, sorry, it's not shit. IPFS, stuff. Ethereum, yeah. Um, Oh, we, no, we don't. We don't support like storage or Filecoin, but there's no reason you couldn't. It's it's really it's really really easy to write um, blob storage layers, and we kind of have to ask people to stop writing new ones because it's like yeah, like a lot of people just want to write one for funsies, but they're basically have all been written, but not Filecoin. So if you want to if you want to add one of those, it's cool. Last one was B2 backblaze. Oh yeah, because there's a, there's a bunch that aren't listed on the slide because they just wouldn't fit. Yeah. So we got all these blobs that are. Inevitably going to a hard drive somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's inevitably going to get corrupted. Yep. Well, how are you dealing with that? Uh, so, like one of the slides was saying that um, all the blobs are stored by their, you know, the SHA-256. So you know if it's corrupted. Yeah. So you, so we know, we know on read. You replicate. Read. You replicate everywhere. Yeah. So how do you decide where to pull it from? 
Well, so presumably you have you know more than one copy. So if if sure. you read it and you find it's wrong, you know you log some big oh, warnings right. and you like you delete it. But I mean, hopefully like your cloud provider isn't totally screwed. But that would be you don't use that blob because it's corrupt and you like have big warnings and you could read from somewhere else. So you don't have any error correction metadata. Well, you mean automatically from one store to the other, yeah. like it would detect and copy uh, automatically? No, 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 there is, there is, there is. Um, the, um, which one was it? Um, well, I don't want to scroll back. One of the storage providers is, um, is Replica. So you can specify N things, and on reads, you, you can specify an order, or you can, you can race them. So you can say these two comes at the same time. So if you read from like this disk and it comes back with a corrupted checksum, it won't use that one because that's an error and it'll use this yeah. other one. Okay. So you can, you can use like remote and then remote to replica. Or you could have two replicas, those ones are remote to talk to your own servers inside your house. And if one of those comes back with a corrupted result, the client will treat it as an error and use the other replica. Right. So I mean, you can wire this up however you want. I don't use that um, for the cloud providers because like, like if they're returning an error, they have bigger problems. Yeah, but um, yeah, that's one of the biggest you know concerns I have with my picture storage is hmm? making yeah. sure it's not corrupted as it sits there for decades. Yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, there's a, a val when you do like a sync validate, it'll validate the checksums of all your blobs too and tell you if um, a pair is a pair is bogus. So can you do like a cron job every month or something that just goes through and revalidates it? Yeah, I mean, you, you could. Or sections. There's a command line uh, PK sync and PK index, uh, which and those do like. Uh, sync validations or kick them off and you can say from range and you can put PK sync or PK index in a cron or the web UI has a limited support for that. Like I can go up here and say uh, uh, server, yeah. server status and I can go down to my sync test three and see like um, the state of my copies. Then I can start a validation. Now the validation is running and you can see it like validating the source blobs right now. And so now it's validating all my stuff on S3. So you can you can schedule that to run periodically, okay. but you're paying for those S3 operations now. So yeah. you do, you may not want, we don't have that on by default. Yeah, you know, it'd be better to do that locally and then. Well, it depends what you want to check. If yeah. if you want to deal with the file I/O lightly and, and you know pay for that activity on your local disk, that's fine. You're probably not paying much for it, yeah. impacting performance of other things. But here you're paying for operations. Right. So, yeah. How about interfacing just to what we think of as automation tools like Word, Excel, or uh, open source? I mean, yeah, you you could put an NFS server on top of the Fuse layer if you want, and you could export this as like you know a Samba or NFS server. But it's not the most efficient thing, but it works. I mean, you're talking about having people in an office use this as storage directly. Well, one of the biggest problems is people you know, deleting the new version or whatever. This is stupid. And yeah. Tracking stuff. Well, hopefully offices aren't, you know, you know using um, files. I mean, like writing documents with like versions and renaming it to like locked version two, and like I have the lock on that file. It's kind of a, a bad way to collaborate on files. How about a simple thing? It's just working on, on, on versions of a, of a document for later collaboration or whatever. Uh, I, wanna, I don't want to have to go out to the file system, store a file, and then separately put it into Perky. I want to directly access Perky. Yeah, yeah, that's what the fuse layer lets you do. So you, you, can, you, you can mount your store. You, yeah, you, you, right. can, you can make a virtual file system that looks like a real file system to your host operating system, yeah. but the backing is actually per keep. Okay, so you, anybody ever get anywhere with a DMA interface? The what? Document Management Association? Or no. Mm -hmm. Can you start with SharePoint? We wanted to do some demos, though. Um, okay. But no, we don't. We don't support any protocol like DMA or something. Um, do you want to send a photo? Oh sure. sure so sure. this is uh, this is our sure, demo instance running at demo.perkeep.org that you can't really see. And um, I will. Does, does anyone um, not want to be on the internet or on our demo.perkeep, which what's is private? The, okay, Linux best. Oh, what's the password again? Uh, thank you, CSS. Okay. All lowercase. Travis. So I'm I'm going to uh, tweet as the Perkeep org Twitter account, and I'm just like hi from Bellingham. All right. Slide. Ah. So he's not putting that on the internet. That's just going to this. <laughs> it's on the internet, but not the public one. <laughs> 
This nice. one will go on our Twitter account, so cover up your face if you don't want to be on the internet. <laughs> Wave! Okay. <laughs> so. All right. Yeah, you okay. So that tweet came in in real time. There's like, you know, websocket y thing. That came from Xandroid app. This one, I'm saying hi. Doo -doo. So my tweet is going through from the Linux Fest Northwest Twitter account. So much for real time. <laughs> um, maybe I didn't enable actually real time. So you go into here, into uh, importers, oh, old UI, tweets, accounts, ha. Import interval, toggle, auto, I don't know, start. Maybe I had. <laughs> cool demo, huh? So you can only track your tweets, yes. right? You can't like, you, have it track someone else's. You you nice. can add other people. Yeah, but as many as many clients as you want, as many accounts as you want. So we're supposed to um, we we have like we do the Twitter long poll subscribe thingy. So tweets should come within a second. So that demo kind of failed, but um, we just created this uh, demo per keep.org instance yesterday. So it's not really configured totally yet. But yeah, so in here, I can go in to this uh, photo he just uploaded from his home, or from his phone. You can see the permanode. You can see like, you know, the content is this. Then I could go over. Um, There's a hyperlink in the blob view, isn't there? Yeah, I could probably do that. So I could see, um, here's the content. Yeah, so here's the signer's phone. The content is this. Um, that's an image, not the object, and uh, the raw blobs. This is a file named this. Here are the chunks of the JPEG. Here is the index or metadata. So here's the like the width of the image. Here's the latitude and longitude. So now I can go th things and do like a search query for location Bellingham. Did I spell Bellingham right? Oh, we don't have the uh, the key. The geocode, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we use the Google geocoding API. And they recently uh, locked it down. And it's no longer free, and so you have to like go get a free API key. Um, so, but I can do it online. That's it's how good. we translate a name from the search to real coordinates. We, we ask Google where where it is. We want to move to using some open street mappy thing. Like we use open street maps for um, uh, location Bellingham. Yeah. Oh, so there's a me too setting up last year. Oh, there's a talk. Live camera. Oh, so here's two years ago, the demo. Anyone see yourself in that photo from last year? Oh, you can show it on the map now, since it's a location. Yeah. Location. Really Bellingham. fine. Bellingham. Why is the piggy sad? I think the piggy goes sad when it... Um, the web socket. When, when the web socket, socket goes down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. So, I don't know. It doesn't like the network here, or whatever. But as I zoom in, you can see all, like, Tweets and photos and check-ins from Bellingham. So, so um, we need help with uh, the web UI. We kind of suck at front-end stuff. This is kind of a weird mix of technologies. We use like um, we use React and we use like Clojure and we use uh, Gopher.js to compile Go to JavaScript. We use we're thinking uh, um, this is like using Leaflet and um, it's just the Google the Google libraries. Closure, yeah, Clojure uh, libraries. Closure, yeah. Sorry. Um, so it's kind of like we want to do a lot more with the UI, but it's not really our forte. So if you're uh, interested in like rewriting the UI using something new and fancy, um, we hear good things about like TypeScript and Polymer and um, web components, blah blah blah. But we just this is things we suck at. So um, we also need um, an iOS client. Maybe our Android client kind of sucks, and we don't really like writing Java. Maybe you like Java or Kotlin. Um, we're not really good at either of these. Um, so, um, you, you've got six million objects. Yeah. How big is that? Well, not not Same. objects. Parts I have six. Objects. I have six point six million blobs, which is you know Those whatever. Those are like little parts of objects. So I, I think I have around four hundred gig total. It's not gonna fill up your laptop hard drive anytime soon. Um. Yeah, I mean, it depends how big your laptop hard drive is, but yeah, probably probably not. I mean, hard drives keep getting bigger, and like the amount of data you care about is also getting bigger. But like, they seem to be not really one. It's not you, really. You don't need to have it on your laptop. You can have it on any kind of server at home or wherever, and your laptop can just have a view of it thanks to the peak amount or whatever. Yeah, if I if I run like the Fuse file system on my laptop, 
it it will lazily fault in from the server. And it will only, like, you can keep a cache. So you can say, like, oh, I only keep 100 gig on my laptop. And it was, you know, whatever 100 gig was accessed most recently. So, yeah, you, you can even have a, there's, like, a union blob storage where, if, like, you have, like, three servers and none of them have enough storage. You can say, like, I use whatever's available and I do reads from all of them. And I do writes to, like, one of them randomly. So you, you can shard things out however you want. Does that require a master? Um, no. You can, you can make them all, like, consistently hash and shard the same way. And you can, like, DNS load balance between them all. So the reason yeah. it doesn't require a master is, is the policy is if there are two conflicting like mutations, there's the last one wins, I think. Yeah, or you can specify like so uh, that is just the policy. Yeah, so it's always eventually consistent between if you sync them all every which way. Anyway, I think we're uh, let you out to lunch early. Unless anyone has questions or cool, thank you. Same.